see you all here. Uh, I'm Sasha Londi. I work for Codecademy, and I do product and curriculum work there. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about this idea of programming as a new literacy, show you what our platform can do. Hopefully, it can be a useful tool for you. Um, and then there'll be a little bit of time at the end where you can connect to people uh, here who may have similar projects or be in similar situations or want to use, uh, build similar things. So I'll give you some time to connect with each other and maybe set up some collaborations in the future. So unfortunately, my remote uh, isn't working, so I'm going to have to be walking back and forth, which is a pain, but there we go. So um, by the way, before I start, I want to say that I, before I worked in tech, I was a teacher for five years, and I taught physics. In my second year, I started a neuroscience class. Uh, which is a bit of a bother because uh, there's really no curriculum for high school level neuroscience. So I had to sort of take the college level and the grade school level material and dumb them up and down respectively to uh, make, be appropriate. And so I totally sympathize with the sort of uh, brave new world that you guys are facing here as you, as you tweak your curriculum and uh, change things so rapidly. And so, uh, welcome, come on in. Sorry, Let's see. Lost no worries, so <laughs> So what is literacy? Um, literacy is, our idea of literacy has changed a lot. It used to be the three R's, so reading, writing, and arithmetic. And this is the, the 19th century model. And it's really based on the Industrial Revolution, when the point of school was to turn out people who would be emotionally and logistically prepared to work in factories. Um, but times are changing, and we need to add a very important fourth literacy to our canon of things that we teach students. <laughs> Um, so bear with me, this fourth R is a little bit of a stretch, but uh, we need this for that as fourth R, which is algorithms. Um, we need to add computer science. As all of our gadgets, all of our various gadgets become more and more technological, this isn't going to change, right? So we need to know how to use them. Um, and knowing a little bit about what's going on behind the scenes and what's going on with your computer, even if you're not a professional software engineer, is really, really empowering. It gives people a tool set that they didn't have before. So here are some example tweets that people have, uh, people talk to us on Twitter a lot. And here are some things that they've said, and this is one of my favorites. Um, Ellie Wheeler says, instead of getting ready for a party, I'm squeezing in lessons at Code Academy. Feels like I'm being let in on, a, on secret powers, a set of secret powers. And I love this tweet because it really is a set of secret powers. It allows you to do things you couldn't do before, um, and allows you to do things other people think is pretty magical. Uh, also, Code Academy just made my first changes to a blog post using HTML mode versus visual mode. Thank you. So this person is now able to have even more control over projects they're already doing than they did before just by knowing a little bit of code. Um, this one's interesting. This guy uh, teaches in uh, organic chemistry class, and his students were having trouble with the concept of NMR. And he was like, wow, coin flipping would be a really great model for this. Um, <coughs> but I don't want to have them have to flip coins thousands of times to do the simulation, so why don't I use my new JavaScript uh, knowledge? And he basically built a simulator that they could use that flips the coins thousands of times and then makes a graph and really illustrates the principles he's trying to teach really well. And he says he didn't know any JavaScript before, I'll tell you what code year is later, but he, he didn't know any JavaScript before um, taking the lessons that we have. Uh, and people's insults vocabulary has also increased. Um, other half learning CSS using Code Academy just Skype me, pound you, padding, colon, 200%, hashtag burn, hashtag code. We've seen a few of these go by of people like, starting to use their lingo to, um, to, to basically like rib each other a little bit. Um, these are my personal favorites. So, um, so right now, there is um, a little bit of this power goes a long way. There's a war for talent on right there. And I don't use this hashtag. Like, this is a real hashtag, by the way. And there are tons of articles about it right now. Because especially in Silicon Valley, there literally is a war for talent. Um, people are, their tech companies will give thousands of dollars of bonuses to their own employees who refer someone who they end up hiring. Um, it's, it's pretty remarkable. And, and there's, I have this graph here of the, the top six tech companies right now and the, the amount that they're poaching talent off of each other. And this graph shows that Facebook's the big winner right now and Yahoo's the big loser. But there's a constant tussle for engineering talent. Um, but as the demand for programmers is going up, the education for programmers is going down. And uh, this makes no sense at all. It really should be the opposite. Schools should be preparing students for life and preparing them for careers that are rewarding and interesting and valuable, um, and they're not. Uh, this is a graph, this is about the US, but this is in the last, just the last few years. The, the classes that are offered, this is intro class, this is AP level class, kind of like A levels, um, has gone down in the last few years, which makes no sense. Um, but here's what we've learned. At Code Academy, we've learned a few things. We've learned that people really like to program. 
Uh, we have actually several million users who've signed up on our site, who are registered, made an account, and have taken our lessons. So people really want, there's demand out there to learn how to program. Uh, we started this program called Code Year. We launched around January 1st, around the time everyone makes those New Year's resolutions and hits the gym. Uh, and it's still time, there's still time, Learn to Code in 2012. And as of yesterday, we had this number of people learning to code this year who sign up to get a weekly email emailed to them uh, that has a lesson in it that they can take. Uh, and this has had huge resonance in the US and actually all around the world, this concept. Um, even the mayor of New York City is getting in on it. He, he signed up as well. I don't know if he's been keeping up with his lessons, but he, uh, this is a huge shot in the arm. The New York tech scene, by the way, this is just a little side note here, uh, is booming right now and they're, they're n not nearly the size of Silicon Valley out in California, but they're very much working on it, and Mayor Bloomberg is, has been a big force behind that. Um, and this is a worldwide phenomenon. We have people, users in over 100 countries, and that number keeps growing. It's not just the US, it's not just the UK, it's all over the world. Um, and it's really pretty cool to see that grow. Um, we have lessons in all sorts of languages coming very soon, by the way, in case you have students who are not native English speakers, we've got um, other lessons coming. So people want to learn, shockingly. And why do I say shockingly? Um, I say shockingly because the stereotypes about computer science and about programmers are so negative. Um, and in a lot of ways, a lot of our educational offerings are also not, not great and not very inspiring. Um, I want to tell you the story of little Sasha. Not so little, but high school Sasha. When I was in high school, uh, someone, and I still to this day have no idea who, put Intro to Computer Science, Intro to C++ on my schedule. And I didn't know what it was, but I was like, hey, I'll go with it. I'll try this out. And I took the class, and I really liked the, the process of programming. I really liked problem solving. I really liked putting the pieces together. I don't think anyone actually likes debugging, but I found it really satisfying when I found that bug. You know, I do the, like this pump. And, um, so I, I enjoyed programming, but the projects we did were so trivial and so boring that um, which is fine, sometimes you have to do trivial and boring projects like to learn a concept to get that, but I went through the course and I came out having no idea what computer science was for and no idea how interesting and useful it is and how much you can change the world with a software program. Like Platforms like Facebook right now allow one person to reach millions of people and that really wasn't possible before technology, but it is now and that's huge power. I had no idea. So instead of computer science, I left. I went off to physics, because physics tells you why you can see through a window but not a wall. It explains where we come from, why you can't walk through things. Like, it, it explains the very nature of the universe, and, and that was totally fascinating to me in high school. They did a great job of putting me through a rigorous academic program, but one that was interesting and that I could see myself doing for a very long time. And I did go on to major in physics, but um, I left CS because of the boring projects. So this is in Idaho. Here's a town called Boring. Um, this is a quote, this, both my experience as a student, um, and I found this as a very helpful guiding principle as a teacher. This is a rough paraphrase of a famous quote that's misattributed so many times that I don't actually know who first said it. Um, but education is not the filling of a pail, but the lighting of a fire. We're not just here to cram knowledge into kids' heads, that's, you know, one very important function of teachers, but uh, to create new learners and to create people who want to teach themselves more. Um, and I found this a very helpful guiding principle as a teacher and in my work at Code Academy as well. Um, so we don't want to, I basically don't want to create a generation of consumers, but a generation of makers, people who make their own new worlds. Um, and this is a lot of resonance right now. This is uh, Wired Magazine. Does anyone know who this is? Without reading? I don't think you can actually possibly read that, but does anyone know who this is? Um, this is a woman named Lenore Freed, who runs a company called Adafruit. Have you heard of Adafruit? Okay. If you're doing Arduino stuff, one person has. If you're doing Arduino <laughs> stuff, you should definitely check out Adafruit Industries. It's basically a mail order service where you can get pretty much any kind of Arduino accessory connection. If you're making any kind of electronic thing, it's super useful. But she was recently on the cover of Wired Magazine um, because of this upsurge in DIY and people who want to make things. Not only that, but the industry changes very quickly. Um, Ruby on Rails is one of the most sought after skill sets in Silicon Valley right now. It's hugely popular in the industry, particularly for new technology companies, and it didn't exist at all seven years ago. So in the last seven years, it's become the number one most sought after skill set in Silicon Valley and very well paid, but it didn't exist seven years ago. So the industry changes quickly and will continue to change quickly. 
So we don't want to just teach students Java or just teach students Python or even just teach them Ruby, but we want to teach them to be able to pick up new skill sets and teach themselves as their industry changes and stay fresh and stay current. And so to do that, um, we basically need to give them, <laughs> here's, here's why, because if you, uh, you know the phrase, if the only thing you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail? Um, we basically want to give them as many tools as possible and the ability to pick up new tools and figure out how they work. Um, and to do that, they have to learn by doing and learn by discovering, because that's how they're going to continue to learn after they've left the classroom. They're going to teach themselves things, they're going to pick up a new like Flask, a new Python framework, and play with it one weekend and figure out how it works. And we want to produce students who love to do that and can teach themselves and have those skills. Um, so programming really is a 21st century literacy. It's super important. I know I'm preaching to the choir here, because why else would you be here if you didn't think this is true? Um, and that wraps up the intro portion of my talk here. I want to show you a little bit about um, a little bit about our website to give you a tour. I know some of you are familiar with it. Um, there's a whole side of it that I think some of you are not familiar with, so I want to show you that, and then give you some workshop time to, uh, I'll take questions after that, and then some time to work in groups and do a sort of more workshop type piece. Cool? Okay. So, oops, let's go back here for a second. Um, so what I'm gonna show you on the website is our lessons which interweave instruction and coding. So students get a little bit of instruction, they do a little bit of coding, they do a little instruction, they do a little coding, so we go back and forth. Um, I have a Python book that I bought on Amazon that uh, has like four and a half stars, it comes with huge thumbs up from everyone, and you have to read 250 pages before you can touch a keyboard. It's unbelievable. So we don't, I, I obviously didn't finish the book. Um, we, uh, we don't do that, we get you coding immediately from the first page, uh, which people love. And it, it's, it's, we always like trick them into programming, you'll see. Uh, we also have the flip side of our platform is a lesson creation tool. So we have a tool where you can create these interactive lessons. We have a rigorous testing program so you know that they're ready to go. So if you create a lesson this summer that you want to use with your students, you can run it through our testing program to make sure that it's ready to go before it hits the classroom. So your students aren't finding typos and problems. You find them before they get launched. Um, and sharing. You can share your, uh, your lesson with anyone in the world. Uh, and which is cool because it enables you, if you put together a great set of lessons, it's very popular. It allows you to sort of get your name out there as a teacher and as a thought leader um, in the CS world. So, here is, uh-oh. <laughs> Let's hope this loads. I got a 500 error the first time I tried to load it. I'm going to type some words with our engineers when I get back. Um, so, this is our front page. There's supposed to be a box right here that says, hi, what's your name? Type it in quotes so it gets people using strings right away, but it's not loading. So, pretend it's there. Hopefully it'll come back in a second. Um, and that's really our launch site. We want to get people coding right away. We don't want people to have to spend a ton of time installing software on their system or reading 250 pages of a book. We just want to get started. That's the fun part, right? That's the exciting part, that magical part when the computer does what you tell it to do. We want to get them to that feeling as fast as possible. Um, this is the tracks page. This is a hint of the content um, that we have right now. We've got a JavaScript track, and tracks are a uh, linear series of courses that, uh, and th this structure is going to change in the next few weeks, but it's basically a linear set of courses, and it's got projects uh, and lessons as well as challenges here where they build a blackjack game from scratch. Um, we also have non-track content, and this organization is going to change as well in the next few weeks, but we've got um, lessons in JavaScript web as well as Python here. To see the Python button, by the way, you have to go to your settings and become a beta tester, and then that button will appear right now. If you just go here without being a beta tester, it won't appear. Um, and here you can see all of our courses, uh, all from the tracks as well as all other courses that people have submitted, and there's some really interesting ones in here. Um, we also have labs. This is sort of a secret hidden feature because it's not fully finished yet, but you guys might find it very useful in testing out your code. Uh, you can find at the bottom of the page there's a labs link, and um, we offer it in Ruby, Python, and JavaScript, and you can basically run your code um, here, so you can type like, you know, you can get a reference error if you want, or type in a string, um, and you can also run your code over here, and then it'll run on the right. So it's sort of like an instant um, programming environment for all three languages if you don't want to say anything else. 
Um, let me show you this here. Uh, here is the entry page for our um, course creator tool. So it's at codecademy.com slash creators. And once you log in here, you'll see our course creator tool where you can make your courses. And to help you out, just FYI, to keep this in mind for the workshop portion, there is a demo course that shows you all the submission correctness tests uh, and how to write them. And this is sort of a useful tool to file it for later. So, um, okay. That's a brief, brief tour. Um, so there are a few different ways with a tool like this that's a little different than a traditional textbook or website or tutorial. There are a few different possibilities and ways you can work it into your classroom. And these are some ideas that I've heard over the course of this weekend and for several weeks before. Um, and because all of you are coming from very different schools with very different populations and age groups and resources available and levels, levels of comfort with the material, uh, I can't tell you what is a best practice because it really depends on your classroom, but here are some ideas to get you thinking. Um, one is this flipped classroom idea. How many of you have not heard this phrase before? Okay, cool. So you all pretty much know what it means. It basically allows you to um, use class time where you're most needed, which is helping people when, in that moment when they're stuck, rather than delivering content or having them watch or read something, which they can all do at different rates anyway, so you may as well have them do it at home. Um, and so have them read material, and then come in and work on stuff in the classroom. Another one is code clubs. If your school doesn't have, I'm assuming you're all here because you teach ICT in your school in some fashion, but if you have colleagues who don't, or if they're kids who aren't signed up but want to build something after school, a code club that meets after school, where they work on projects together, uh, that's one possibility for using uh, these and other similar lessons on the internet. Uh, one interesting case we see is parents and students learning together a lot. Homeschooled families love these lessons. Cool if you're, if you're teaching ICT and your parents want a sense of what their kids are working on, this is a handy resource that you can send them that's totally free where they can get a sense of what it is that their kids are actually doing. Um, and this is an interesting one that a few people have run by me. I haven't seen anyone who's used it yet, so if you do this, I would love to hear how it goes. Um, learning by teaching, having your students create lessons. Maybe if there's a particularly difficult concept that you want to make sure that they understand, you could use this as assessment. Or you could use this to like have a student teach each other. Because one thing that, um, you know how sometimes a beginner's words are clearer to another beginner than the teacher's words? Um, this might be one way of facilitating that. I'd love to see how this goes if you try it. Um, and you, of course, can create custom lessons that are tailored to your population. You can put in inside jokes about the, the headmaster or whatever um, and create custom lessons on our platform. And collaboration. You can collaborate with other teachers. Um, I've been reading in your newsletters that there's a lot of untapped uh, IT talent in the country that uh, there are IT professionals who are part of CAS. You can collaborate with them to create lessons as well. We have a collaboration tool that's in very early stages. It's in alpha right now. I can connect you to it uh, as an admin here if you want to try it today and collaborate with someone else in the room. It'll be released in the next few weeks, I think, for everyone else. So, questions? been getting a lot, even just last night, so, questions. Is there any plans to introduce any more languages? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. And if so, what? <laughs> or is that trade secret? Well, so I just, so right now we're, we have HTML, CSS, JavaScript, Python, and Ruby. Um, right now we have, we're focusing on getting the Ruby shell bug-free and up, and up and running. We don't offer any compiled languages yet, but we will soon. Probably not in weeks, probably in the, in the order of months. Um, and we ultimately want to offer every language. I know some people have requested assembly because it's part of the AQA A levels, yes? Um, I don't know how soon we'll have assembly, but ultimately we want every language. Right now we only have um, interpreted languages. Um, I, I work in lots of schools and I have to do not just programming, but what we used to call ICT. And, and I'd be interested in trying to develop some sort of um, curriculum that includes programming as one element but also includes e-awareness and communication type strands as well. So, Great. Communication around what? Um, just the fact that we do need to be good at communicating. So for example, if you, write a if you do a PowerPoint, mm -hmm. ultimately you could show that to somebody but it would be better to actually put that online and share it and get mm -hmm. comments from other people. So beyond just writing a PowerPoint, showing it at the front, and getting a bit of feedback from the people that are in the room. 
Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, some people have said like, oh, I want a Codecademy for design or a Codecademy for grammar and all sorts of things. Um, I, I tweeted the other day that I want one for hairstyles because I'm not, my repertoire is not very large in terms of that, so I want a Codecademy for updates. I think you could potentially use this sort of tool for a lot of things, so I'm curious to see what you come up with there. Yeah. I think a few issues with it on the iPad here. Is it? <laughs> yeah. Is that uh, our iPad, it's not, I'm sorry, I apologize for our iPad version. It's just not very good right now. Yeah, um, dropping out. Dropping out? What do you mean? Uh, it's, it's, it's not connecting, and it's not coming up with the, the labs. Okay, I'll take a look at that. I'm not sure how, there, there's a reason we're not promoting labs on the site right now. It's it's in early stages as well. But our iP we're, we're working on hiring, again, War for Talent. We've been trying to find a mobile developer for weeks. Um, I think we have one we're going to hire, so we should have a better version of the iPad site coming out soon. If you know any mobile developers, let me know. In New York. What age yeah. uh, would you recommend sort of, <coughs> age children? Sort of, <coughs> for this? Yeah. So the question was, what age would you recommend? We've heard of literally age 6 through age 87 using the site and loving it. It's really not age specific. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people assume it's for children, but adults uh, love it as well. So it, it, it's really more a question of learning style. It works really well for some learning styles and not well for others. And, and um, Actually, I haven't heard of many specific learning styles it doesn't work for, but generally people like learning by doing. But it, it ages, it doesn't seem to be a factor. Yeah. As a teacher, is it possible to set up like a class uh, accounts that a teacher you can log in and manage um, rather than just the kids set So monitor what students are working on and well, what their projects. you've got visibility really quickly and easily and a bit of control. Absolutely. Yeah, no, that's a great idea, and that's something we want to build. We don't have it yet, but we're definitely going to build it. Yeah. Come back again. Okay. Uh, just having a look at the moment on the tracks, there's a JavaScript, Web Fundamentals, and the jQuery. Mm -hmm. Is there any plans, as you said, you're using other languages, Python, Ruby, and so forth? Will they have track lessons? Uh, yeah, I forgot well? to mention that there's a Python track coming out right. starting July 23rd. Okay. So there is a Python track being worked on in the background. Some of the courses for the Python track are in the beta section right now. Okay. Um, yeah. Not all of the Python sections in the beta track and the beta section are in the Python track, okay. but there's some overlap there. Yeah, we're working on more. Um, ultimately, we're going to move away from this very linear track structure into one that's a little bit more flexible okay. uh, and a little less linear and more project driven. But that's a little further down the line. Yeah. Um, you've got the rewards on the site, all the badges, that kind of thing. Are they, is, are they shared, or how are they shared with other people? Because we can get like badges to say you do know, yep. hours or whatever. Yep. How are they shared? Is it, is it more like Twitter? Is it, can they specify who you share it with? Absolutely, yeah. Right now you have the option when a badge pops up. So we have badges for completing your first lesson, 10th, 100th. We really need a badge for 1,000. I don't think we have one right now. Because um, people are complaining on Twitter, like, I did 1,000 exercises, where's my badge? Uh, and, um, and for finishing various other courses as well. And you have the option to share on Twitter and Facebook. Um, and it shows up on your profile on the site. If you click your little icon, you'll see your profile, and it shows up there as well. And that's, that's where it's shared. By the way, a comment on the badge system. I know this is a, a somewhat controversial topic. And uh, it's really very motivating for some people, and it's not motivating for others. And we're going to do um, some major changes to our gamification system coming up as well. And I want to make sure, you know, I'm a former teacher, I want to make sure that our incentives are aligned with actual learning incentives, and so that that like, extrinsic motivator is lined up with the, the intrinsic motivators and the behaviors that we want to encourage on the site. And I want to make sure that we do it in a way that is in the best benefit for their learning. So um, I'm happy to talk about that as well. Yep. You're looking at, you know, you've got the badge system. Yep. Is that going to be integrated with the, I'm probably asking the wrong question. Is That's a lot. Uh, we don't have immediate plans to integrate with. He's referring to the Mozilla Open Badge platform, where you're able to um, basically have this. I think they call it a backpack or knapsack, right? Over here, knapsack of badges from various sites, and you can sort of present them all in one place. Mm -hmm. We don't have immediate plans to coordinate with them on that, although we are collaborating with Mozilla on a few other projects. Right. So that may change in the future. Yeah. Why doesn't it work with Internet Explorer? There's a lot of, <laughs> a lot of okay. schools have Internet Explorer by default and some of the technicians are a little yeah. bit... Uh, 
yeah. about installing, I don't know why, but they are about installing Google Chrome. Can they upgrade to IE9 by any chance? Probably. Okay, because the site, how many of you use, are restricted to Internet Explorer 7 and 8? At the moment. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry, first of all. I don't know how much of pain that is. I can't, it's such a security risk. I can't believe people still do that. Um, if you can convince them to upgrade to IE9, the site will work beautifully. Um, we don't allow IE7 and 8 because what we're trying to do is so complex that we just can't support those browsers. They're so... Um, how can I put this diplomatically? I can't. They're so awful. They're such terrible browsers that we can't um, we can't do everything we want to do and support them. We can't do both, so we made the choice to hopefully you can use that as ammo with your IT department. I hope. I'm sorry. No. There is a way to run Chrome within Internet Explorer. I can't remember what the project's called. Don't even know what that's called. It There's does a... mention it when you try to load it up in a, yeah. in a terrible browser. <laughs> How to do it. Don't tell Microsoft they said that. Um, okay, good. Yeah, give that a try and let me know how it goes. So hopefully that's a good workaround for you. Any other questions before we do some workshop stuff? You, I'm going to obviously not leave, so you can ask me more questions if you like. Okay, thank you very much, by the way, for being such an awesome audience. I'm really excited to see what you all come up with.